Okay, gang, um, I am coming to you live from uh, an airport. I am in Denver, uh, making my way to Las Vegas right now, um, and uh, getting ready to go do some fights. Um, <clears throat> I just wanted to upload this video on aerobic exercise. Uh, we talked about it uh, the the week and a half ago uh, in class. I asked you guys to please read this section and be prepared to uh, answer questions about it, specifically during your final exam. Uh, I do want to be clear that uh, you are still responsible for um, the agility reading. You are responsible for the aerobic exercise uh, reading, and you are also responsible for uh, the cross-training reading um, that will be delivered probably at the end of the week or the beginning of next week. Um, and these things, you do have to be ready to answer questions for them on your final presentation. So even if your athlete is not using these, you still need to demonstrate that you uh, fill out an extraction sheet for this, this chapter, that you did read it, re read it, sorry, and you can, uh, in fact, uh, apply the information or not apply it based upon your athlete. So when you come to your final presentation, Please make sure you have those extraction sheets from these three readings. That's agility, aerobic exercise, and cross-training or functional training. Um, have those ready to show Lucas once you arrive. Um, so what I'm going to do on this lecture is just kind of go over um, go over what you already know and what we've already talked about um, in class, we did do a small lecture on this, and I just want to make sure that I smooth out any misunderstandings that you might have because you're reading this on your own. So uh, let's get into it. So when we talk about aerobic fitness, some of the most important things to think about are intensity, frequency, and duration, okay? The lower the intensity, the higher the frequency, and the higher the duration, the more adaptations you're going to have on that far left aerobic uh, exercise, ad uh, exercise metabolism uh, adaptations that you're going to have, right? So we're going to have some really strong changes and adaptations that are going to happen when we just do aerobic exercise, right? So we know that we have the aerobic and we have the anaerobic, right? And we were kind of talking about this spectrum over the course of this course. Um, so we're kind of focusing on this right now, right? The far left, and we're really not talking about any sort of anaerobic fitness. Um, so when we do uh, focus primarily on that far left metabolic pathway, which would be fatty acids and and uh, the mitochondria, of course, what's going to happen is we're ultimately going to lower our heart rate. And that heart rate being lowered is going to happen uh, at rest. So we were talking in class about, you know, does do we get stronger heart rates? Do we increase our maximum heart rate or our age predicted heart rate? And I kind of said no. You know, the heart will undergo some pretty serious adaptations. It will undergo some serious remodeling. But one of the first things that is going to occur is we are going to have a decrease in resting heart rate, right? So let's say we were at some point, we were at 70 beats per minute, right? And as we start going, uh, as we start doing this aerobic exercise, um, those adaptations that are going to occur are going to drop us to, let's say, 50 beats per minute, okay? And we talked about how, let's see if we have our maximum heart rate here, right? I'm just going to put maximum heart rate, H, R. Sorry, I'm drawing with my right hand on the mouse. I don't have a lot of equipment with me in the airport. Um, if we have that drop here, what that does is it makes this kind of more functional space for us to operate in. So the maximum heart rate doesn't change, but we bought ourselves about 20 beats per minute lower, which means that we can operate more efficiently in this in this spectrum, right? This heart rate spectrum or this heart rate continuum. So basically the heart is going to work a more efficiently, but at using a lot less energy, right? And what's going to happen is with the aerobic exercise, every organ in the body is going to be more sensitive to signaling and is going to operate more efficiently as a result of aerobic exercise. And we'll, we'll kind of talk about that a little more uh, within the next few slides. So 
Um, you guys all know that the cardiovascular system consists of the heart, right, and the vasculature. And we know that the heart is going to undergo adaptations that is going to decrease its ability um, to, it's going to increase its function and it's going to work way less intensely, right? And the vasculature system is going to play a role in that because we are going to increase our vasculature system. So we know that we're going to have angiogenesis and we're going to increase our capillary density. I showed you guys some pictures in the um, in the lab when I showed you some, some how we increase capillaries. And if we increase capillaries, um, that's going to also decrease our blood pressure, right? So everything kind of drops a little bit. And like I, I gave you guys that example in the lab and I said well imagine if we uh, had a hose and we turned that hose on and we stuck our thumb over it and we would have a certain pressure in that hose but as we slowly started removing our thumb from the spigot uh, that pressure would drop more 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 and more so um, as the heart increases its efficiency and as the capillaries increase in their numbers we not only have a decrease in heart rate Right. I'm just going to say our heart rate, but we also have a decrease in blood pressure. Um, and the other thing that's going to occur is now we have uh, more sensitivity to um, exercises signaling. Right. So in the presence of chemicals such as epinephrine, norepinephrine and acetylcholine, right, the heart will be able to increase and decrease its rate at which it works. And again, like I said, if we have maximum heart rate here, right, age predicted maximum heart rate, and you guys should know what that is, right, and we were at 70 beats per minute, right, but through aerobic exercise, we dropped our resting heart rate to 50 beats per minute, which is where most athletes are. They're about 50 to 55, right? So we dropped 20 beats per minute. Now we can be more sensitive in this heart rate continuum to epinephrine, norepinephrine, and acetylcholine. And what's going to happen there is the heart will not work as hard to maintain a certain level of exercise intensity because we are far more um, sensitive to these chemicals now. Um, so which means we'll also use less of them. All right. So kind of keep that in mind. Let's move on to the next slide here. And here we're going to talk about just acute responses. Okay. So the acute response to aerobic exercise. Um, now this doesn't, when we do aerobic exercise, we, it doesn't do much to skeletal musculature. We don't really increase size. We don't really increase density. Um, we do have some changes, changes in muscle fiber. We talked about that, right? You get some uh, hybrid fibers that might come about. Um, but we are going to have some changes to the vascular system. So I'm just going to put a V, right? We're going to have some changes to the vascular system. We're also going to have some changes to the nervous system, right? So the excitation of the heart is going to be commanded by the sympathetic nervous system and the parasympathetic nervous system and the neurotransmitters, right? So we have changes in vascularity. We have favorable changes in uh, neurochemistry, right, or, or neurological responses. Um, and these two changes are going to favorably, uh, favorably alter heart rate and most importantly, stroke volume, right? So when we talked about that VO2 max equation, we talked about how stroke volume is uh, very, very, very important in increasing um, heart function while decreasing heart work or heart work intensity, right? Or how hard the heart, how hard the heart is going to work. So these, these acute responses are going to change the heart rate and going to change the stroke volume and ultimately that is going to change the cardiac output. And these are the major adaptations that is going to happen uh, when we start to do this uh, aerobic exercise, right? Um, and what we're going to see here is not only do we have these changes to the vascular system, we have changes to the, to the nervous system, right? We have more sensitivity of these, um, these neurotransmitters to the heart. We have an increase in heart rate and an increase in stroke volume. We're also going to have some favorable changes to um, how we use fuel, right? So that's another change that's going to occur. So let's look at... 
um, some more changes. So, so right now you're thinking you should be thinking the most important part is intensity, right? We want low intensity with aerobic fitness. Also duration. We want higher duration, which means instead of exercising for 30 minutes, we should be exercising for 50 minutes. We want higher frequency instead of two days a week. We want four days a week. And the more we do these things, the better our heart is going to operate, right? Our heart rate is going to drop. And while that drops, we're going to have an increase in stroke volume, right? We're going to have an increase in the neural drive, right? The neurons and the, the neurotransmitters are going to increase, right? And not necessarily increase in concentration, but they're going to be far more sensitive uh, in, in commanding the heart, right? So think about a sports car. If you're driving a sports car um, uh, on, a, on a very windy road such as this, right? Um, well, that sports car, is that every time you go uh, around some of these curves, it's going to require some braking and then some acceleration and some braking and some acceleration. But that's the same thing that happens with the heart when we have these neurotransmitters released during exercise. We have greater control over the heart and the heart rate and the stroke volume and the cardiac output. And of course, that signals coming from the, the, um, the neurotransmitters, right, so that we can operate more efficiently in these different uh, exercise intensities per se. All right. So ultimately, the, the ultimate goal is to increase heart rate, I'm sorry, decrease heart rate, increase stroke volume, and these will also increase cardiac output. And we're, we'll talk about this a little more, and also fuel. So uh, let's move on to the next slide. So chronic adaptations. So we talked about this. One of the first things that happens is we're going to have an increase in blood volume, right? And we know that the increase in blood volume is, is going to occur a you know, few days to several weeks after we start doing aerobic, aerobic activity, right? And that's going to depend on, again, frequency, right? Intensity and duration, FID. So if we're doing more frequency, uh, more duration, the, the blood volume switch is going to happen faster, right? And we know that that blood volume is going to basically increase the amount of blood that goes into the ventricle of the heart, right? And since there's an increase in blood volume, we're going to have a greater ejection fraction out of the left ventricle. So that is automatically increasing stroke volume, right? So more blood in, more blood out. So stroke volume is going to be a, uh, initially it's going to be a result of an increase in blood volume, which is going to fill the atriums and the ventricles of the heart more. And as a result, we're going to have more ejection, right? So I'll just put E F for ejection fraction. And that just means that that's going to go up, right? So again, the heart is working less intensely we have more blood filling the ventricles of the heart. And because we have more blood, we have more ejection fraction. And that stroke volume, which is the same as ejection fraction, right? They're, they're synonymous. That's going to start to increase the cardiac CO. That's CO, cardiac output. Okay. Um, and what's going to happen is because... Uh, this this becomes very ad advantageous now because we will with these adaptations we will begin to increase this aerobic fitness level right um, and we will have uh, we will be able to perform more comfortably within that continuum right I'm just going to go back to 50 right 50 to your age predicted maximum heart rate right we'll be able to function more comfortably within that heart rate continuum. And uh, right now, we, we don't really need to worry about the GLUT4 information, but basically what it's saying is that with our training adaptations with aerobic fitness, we also become more sensitive to, to, to glucose and insulin, which means that we can get greater amounts of glucose into the cell, right? And we can store more glycogen if needed. Or if you're, you know, you're dealing with somebody who has, who has diabetic, uh, the more running they do, the more sensitive they are to uh, insulin and GLUT4 so they can uptake far more uh, glucose as a result. But I don't want you to worry about that too much right now. 
some other things to think about is, again, we're going to talk about some of the acute and chronic vascular responses, right? And uh, another thing I had mentioned in class when we were talking about this is, let's switch to this yellow, is the coronary vasculature is also going to change, right? So if we think about, uh, let's just kind of draw the heart here to the best of my ability, right? Here's the aorta. Uh, okay, so what is going to begin to happen is we are also going to, uh, through chronic exercise, we know that we have these arteries, right, that kind of come on the left and the right hand side of the heart and we know that we're going to get greater vascularization there right so we're going to have more of these kind of capillaries like an increase in the density of those capillaries in the coronary arteries right which is really a favorable adaptation because it's going to mean that there's going to be more oxygen uh, more blood delivered to the hump or heart as it's pumping um, they are going to be they're going to experience better vasodilation, right? So if we have an untrained heart, right, and then we have a chronically exercised heart, the vasodilation will occur where we'll get uh, the, the vessels will dilate and more blood and more oxygen can come to the heart, right? That's going to help in the efficiency as well. Um, and these changes, right, in these changes that are compounded or superimposed on top of the neurological changes, right? We're going to get more sensitivity to those neurotransmitters, right? We're going to have more vascularity, right? We're going to have more capillaries that are going to be uh, uh, increasing. We're, on, we're near contracting skeletal muscle, right? We are going to have, what else did I say? An increase in plasma volume, right? And that's going to lead to a greater stroke volume, right? greater stroke volume, right? And now we have the heart that will start to get some greater vascularization on the um, coronary arteries. And they'll also be more capable of dilating much larger, right? To bring in more blood and more O2. Um, so these are, these are some adaptations in the vasculature that are occurring throughout the body. And again, this is being compounded with the nervous system uh, being more efficient, right? More vascularity uh, within capillaries, more of the plasma volume, agree, meaning an increase in stroke volume, right? So what this does is this allows us to perform right here in an extended periods of time at any given intensity. So what I want all you guys to think about right now is the VO2 test, right? So if you think about the VO2 max test, right? Think about those stages, right? You're two minutes at each stage, and then we increase the grade. And two minutes at each stage, and then we increase the grade. And two minutes at each stage, and then we increase the grade, right? So basically, it looks like this. We start here, increase the grade, right? Increase the grade, increase the grade, increase the grade, right? And what happens here is the more of these adaptations that we have, the farther we can get into that VO2, right? Somebody that is uh, not aerobically conditioned at all, they're going to be done here after like the third stage, right? Because they don't have these, these changes that have been induced as a result of exercising aerobically at a high frequency and a high duration and a low, um, a, a low intensity, right? So, um, the, this is uh, this is what's going to happen with some of the uh, the vascular adaptations that are going to occur, right? So we have it at both the coronary and the periphery, right? So uh, we're going to have um, more capillary density in the periphery, right, near the contracting muscles, and then we're going to have more capillary densities and greater dilation and in within the coronary arteries at the heart. So now if we look at um, some examples of overreaching, right, if we're trying to overreach and um, get those adaptations faster, well, here's what's going to happen. We can have severe consequences because when you're doing aerobic training and you have uh, all of those changes happening in the body at the same time or over the course of several weeks, um, we, we, we have to make sure that there's plenty of time for recovery, right? And if, if we're not recovering, these are all signs of your overtraining, right? You're doing too much. Um, you know, 
Um, and I'll let you kind of, I'll kind of let you look at that and you can read that cause I don't need to read that to you. Um, now I, I was telling you earlier about fuel, right? I was telling you earlier that one of the other things that's going to occur. So we're, again, we're, we're, we're superimposing all of these changes on one another, right? So plasma volume, right? And let's just draw, let's just draw an equation, right? Plus sympathetic and parasympathetic nervous drive or, neur or neural drive, right? And then we have on top of that increased stroke volume, right? And then on top of that, we have uh, decreased heart rate, right? And then on top of that, we have an increase in fuel storage. I'm just going to put an F and fuel usage, right? So this is a really critical part of the exercise story is uh, people who are deconditioned or, or not uh, exercising whatsoever, not only do they not have these changes happening, right? Those things are superimposing on one another, but they also don't store or utilize fuel uh, how athletes do, right? So they're, again, they're not metabolically flexible, right? And we want to create athletes that are flexible, right? They can, they can rise to the occasion of any metabolic demand, whether that's sprinting or long periods of running or running upstairs or buffering lactate, right? Those are all metabolic demands. And athletes can, of course, uh, rise to that occasion because they have all of these things changing at the same time. Um, so we want to also begin increasing the way we store and we burn fuel. And that's something that comes with training as well, right? So as I mentioned before, um, we have more sensitivity to insulin, right? And more sensitivity to glucose, which means that GLUT4 transporter, which takes that is what takes uh, sugar into the cell, that helps us store, recover, and resynthesize uh, glycogen. And glycogen looks like this, right? It's a polymer of all these different glucose molecules that we store inside of the, the skeletal muscle. Well, another thing that happens too is not only do we want to store glycogen and glucose, hang on, I'm let the announcing lady stop announcing. Hold tight. Okay. Robbie Phillips. They're looking for Robbie Phillips. The other thing that's going to happen is we're going to store more lipids uh, or fatty acids in the skeletal muscle, right? Which we call intramuscular triacylglycerols, right? And basically what that looks like is we have that glycerol head, right? I'm just going to put a, a head there and we have three fatty acids that are on the tail. And that's what a triglyceride looks like, or we call it a tag, right? Triacylglycerol, right? And, and all that means is that we are capable of storing more fat and more glucose in the cell as fuel that's readily available. So again, fuel systems are going to be a major thing that happens or changes with aerobic exercise. And that seems to kind of be an, an acute response is um, the fuel system storage and the usage of that fuel that seems to happen fairly quickly. Um, so if we look at an untrained person, right, who is doing exercise, uh, they are insufficient and they are incapable of storing fuel, nor do they have the playmakers to utilize that fuel. So what do I mean by playmakers? Well, I'm talking about enzymes, right? They don't have the concentration or the efficiency of the enzymes in the skeletal muscle or in the fat cells or in the liver to help kind of break down or store or transport these necessary fuels, right? Um, so this causes a limitation on the metabolic process, right? And this will slow down somebody's capacity to work out for a long period of time. So again, if we go to that VO2 maximum oxygen uptake test, right? We have somebody here, here, two minutes, here, two minutes, here, right? Two minutes here. Somebody that is not trained is going to be done here, right? For all the reasons I told you before, but now fuel is another factor that is going to shut somebody down. I, man, I'm really getting bad at this drawing thing. Um, so in an untrained person, this limits their capacity. Um, but it's an easy fix, right? So what happens is within the first few weeks of exercise, uh, again, we're talking about acute responses, right? We will store more fuel, right? So we will store more of it as a result. That doesn't mean that we can utilize it right away. So some of the chronic adaptations that are going to come, 
is we will start to develop more enzymes. I'm just going to put an E for enzymes that will break down this fuel and allow us to use it, right? And again, that's an easy fix, and it's it's not a major adaptation that's going to happen because this is just a matter of transcription and translation, right? This is just a matter of putting some more of these proteins in the cell. And you know what? If we stop exercising, no harm, no foul. These, these proteins will be broken down and we'll go about our daily business, right? So this is a, a kind of quick fix where we can store the fuel and then if we keep exercising chronically in this aerobic um, capacity we will create more of these enzymes uh, probably within the mitochondria right within the citric acid cycle and within the electron transport chain and uh, some of the carnitine shuttles that will bring uh, fatty acids into um, bring fatty acids into the mitochondria uh, these things will begin to change right and then we will get better at storing fuel and we'll be increasing our ability to use that fuel okay um, and that will happen again within the first few weeks um, those changes can happen right um, so let's move on to the next one um, and this you guys can read this this is just kind of telling you that once we have these enzymes that we've up regulated right that we've created through transcription and translation of our DNA now we can use those those respective energy pathways and stay in those pathways a little longer right um, and of course we know that um, exercise is going to have a positive effect on fat mass we don't need to really talk about that very much but it's in your it's in your textbook so i thought i would talk about it and of course why is it going to impact fat mass because if we're talking about fatty acids that's the predominant fuel that is going to be mobilized uh when we begin to exercise um in the aerobic capacity okay so the endocrine system um just a kind of hard and fast explanation of this we know that there's a lot of communication that happens between muscle, fat cells, um, your adrenal glands, your adrenal cortex, uh, your, your endocrine signaling will also become more sensitive to other signals, right? Um, so because your endocrine system basically uh, regulates metabolism, well, if you're getting more fuel stored, and you're also creating more enzymes to help burn that fuel, and you're receiving more frequent messages um, from the neurons, right? Acetylcholine, um, epinephrine, norepinephrine, cortisol, all these things are going to tell uh, fat to release fatty acids, right? Glucagon, these are signals that are coming from different parts of the body to tell fat to basically start breaking down triglycerides and releasing fatty acids into the blood. And those fatty acids are going to be mobilized to uh, contracting skeletal muscle where that energy is needed to create more ATP, right? So um, the, the big takeaway here is that these signals, they become more sensitive to one another, and a single bout of exercise uh, has been shown to vastly increase the sensitivity of those, especially with uh, glucose uptake, GLUT4 transporters, and insulin-mediated glucose uptake. So again, um, very beneficial for someone who is diabetic, but also very beneficial for somebody that wants to have rapid and efficient glycogen resynthesis. All right, so let's now talk about some of the respiratory changes that occur with uh, chronic, frequent uh, aerobic fitness. Um, and once I get through this slide, I'm going to do a little bit of drawing for you guys just to kind of pull some of these pieces together and then show you that Fick equation once again that it's so important. Um, now, we know that the respiratory system uh, is, has an extremely close relationship to the cardiovascular system. So generally changes that happen uh, in the lungs uh, and the heart and the vascularity of the system all kind of change uh, together at the same time. And the reason being is because there's really no use in having adaptations where you have more vascularity and you begin to get more capillaries if you don't increase your capacity to bring in more oxygen. Uh, really, what's the point? So the respiratory changes and the cardiovascular changes are, are very, very closely related. And we will get an increase in 
blood plasma, which we talked about. And we will get an increase in red blood cells eventually as well. And this will uh, certainly have something to do with increases in blood flow uh, while somebody is exercising. And uh, ultimately, this is going to allow for more oxygen to be transported to the working muscles. Now, just because it's transported to the working muscles doesn't mean that 100% of that oxygen is going to get dropped off at the working muscles. So we have to have some adaptations that occur within the muscles as well so that they can take up more of that oxygen being delivered. Um, and so basically what's going to happen is uh, as we um, increase our blood flow and we increase the strength of the heart, we will also be able to increase uh, how much oxygen we saturate the red blood cells with um, through the diffusion of oxygen within the lungs, right? Um, so there's going to be some changes that will happen there as well. And then we know that, uh, of course, any sort of aerobic activity, which could be mountain biking, rowing, swimming, running, light jogging, uh, these are all going to have these types of changes uh, that will occur. So again, so we're going to start kind of compounding some of these things that we've been talking about. Uh, we're going to see some changes in the lungs as well. I'm going to draw L-U-N-G the best I can with my right hand. Good. That kind of looks like lung, but we'll put an S there for lungs. Got it. Boom. That looks good. Explanation point. Um, so what I'm going to do now is I'm going to take a break from the lecture. I'm going to introduce the Fick equation again, and we're just going to talk about some of these changes that are occurring and how it impacts the Fick equation, which impacts uh, the, the VO2 and how much oxygen somebody can uptake and use to produce energy uh, during exercise. So let me get the iPad ready, we'll do some drawing, and then we'll come back and finish up this lecture. Okay, so what you can see here that I've drawn is the Fick equation, okay? And the Fick equation is a representation of VO2 max. Um, so when we're talking about this Fick equation, we have VO2, right? So we have VO2 is equal to Q, and Q, of course, represents, if you follow my pen, stroke volume times heart rate. And I've told you in this lecture that both of these change with chronic exercise in the aerobic capacity. And then we get to times a VO2 difference. And that's the um, arterial venous difference. And I'll explain to you in a moment what that means. Okay, so we have this Fick equation with a couple of variables and each one of these variables represent an important physiological piece. Um, so when we talk about the Q, right, so we're talking about Q here. I mean, let's, let's, boop, just focus on Q. We're talking about stroke volume and we're talking about heart rate. And we know that when we have adaptations to aerobic training, stroke volume is going to go up and heart rate is going to go down, which means the heart is going to work more efficiently at various intensities because the stroke volume has increased. Now, why is the stroke volume increasing? Well, the first reason is we are going to get more, and I told you guys this before, plasma volume, right? And because we get more plasma volume, that is going to have an impact on how much of the plasma loads within the heart, okay? So essentially, if we have more plasma coming into the heart, let's just say that this is the left ventricle, right, of the heart. So this is the left ventricle, and we have, we have plasma coming in. Well, that left ventricle is going to expand, right? And let's just draw some blood in there, right? It's going to fill up with blood, right? This is blood. And that ventricle is going to expand until it can't expand anymore. And then what's going to happen is that left ventricle is going to snap back, right? It's going to snap back and like I said in the in the lab when we were talking about it I was saying like a rubber band so imagine that you stretch out a rubber band until that rubber band can't stretch anymore right you're at the verge of breaking it and then you let it go and that rubber band slap snaps back so that elasticity of the rubber band is the exact same thing that happens within the heart so when we have increased plasma volume we're now going to have more filling of those ventricles which means we're going to have greater snap back and we're going to have greater 
um, ejection fraction, right? And <clears throat> pardon me, stroke volume is essentially ejection fraction. So that means that because we're filling it with more, right? We have more plasma going in, and I'll just say left ventricle. Well, what's gonna happen is it's going to expand, expand, expand with more volume, expand, 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 and then it's gonna snap back and we're gonna have greater ejection fraction. So that means with every pump of the heart, we have more blood leaving, right? And that's going to make the heart work a little less intensely, okay? Um, so what we call this is left ventricle. I'm just gonna put L, V, C, and that means left ventricle compliance. And I'm gonna write that down here. So C, O, M, P, I, L, A, N, C, C, E. So the left ventricle now has more compliance, which means it's going to fill up more and it's going to spit out more of that blood. So because we have an increase in plasma volume, right? We're going to have an increase in left ventricle compliance. And as a result of that, we're going to have an increase in ejection fraction or stroke volume, which means we have more blood leaving the heart. Okay. So that's what's going to occur there. And that's one of the reasons um, we increase our VO2. So when we're focusing on the Q, well, some of the changes that are occurring, that's going to make you better at the VO2 test is an increase in plasma volume, an increase in diastolic filling. So because we have more volume, we have more blood filling that left ventricle. So let me let me draw that. Let's 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 um let me clean this up here, okay? So let's say <clears throat> we have a heart and I'm going to draw a very generic picture because I am certainly not an artist. Um so we'll say this is the heart, right? right atrium, right ventricle, left atrium, left ventricle, okay? And then I'm gonna put another one here, just like the same thing, okay? So we have right atrium, right ventricle, left atrium, left ventricle, okay? So now what happens is, let's say this is before exercise, okay? This is before we really start doing anything. Um, we're just couch potatoes, we're just sitting down. So when we have diastolic filling, that might look something like this in somebody that is not exercising, right? So let's, let's just say, just for the sake of being generic, that only 60% of the left ventricle fills, okay? But then after we start exercising for a long period of time, well, I told you plasma volume increases. I told you left ventricle compliance increases, which means now we have more blood filling inside of that left ventricle. So now it might look something like this, right? And instead of only filling 60% of that left ventricle, now because we have adaptations for exercise, let's say we're filling up 85% of that left ventricle and that's because we increased plasma volume and we increased left ventricle compliance and as a result of this we spit out way more blood in the ejection fraction or the stroke volume which is the exact same thing okay so that is how the q works okay so the q is focusing primarily on cardiovascular changes and that makes sense because we're talking about stroke volume and we're talking about heart rate and those are primarily um, cardiovascular components. Now, when we talk about the um, arterial venous difference, now we're talking more about the A, which is going to be more of a pulmonary function, right? So if we have changes to our um, pulmonary okay, function, that's gonna be our, our lungs, right? Well, the A is going to be the oxygenation, right? So we're talking about the arterial side, right? The oxygenated side. So what happens in the lungs now, let me, let me just kinda, of, whoops, let me change the color. Let's do, oh goodness, let's do 
purple lungs. Why not? Okay, so we have our lungs. Okay, here's the other side. Here's the bronchial tubes, right? Bronchial tubes. Okay, so we have our lungs. And we got to have some adaptations in the lungs in order to increase our VO2. Because VO2 will only go up when there's changes here and changes here and changes here. Okay, they all have to adapt together. Let me clean this up. Okay, so now we're talking about the A, which is going to be more of the pulmonary function, right? So we're talking primarily about our lungs. All right, so what's going to happen to the lungs now when we begin to exercise? Well, guess what? Our respiratory, I'm just going to put R and then fatigue, F A T. Um, I-G-U-E, our respiratory fatigue is going to go down, which means we can breathe more intensely for longer periods of time. We're also going to increase, I'm just going to put our V for ventilatory efficiency. So we're going to be more efficient at breathing in and breathing out. That's another change that's going to happen. And um, if you guys remember when we were in the... Um, field house efficiency, I asked you guys to do some sprints. And then while you're recovering, I asked you to sing happy birthday or sing twinkle, twinkle, little star. And that was me purposely challenging your ventilatory efficiency is can you maintain your breath after running and sing happy birthday? Um, we also will increase our lung diffusion capacity. Sorry, I'm drawing so slow here. I'm trying to talk and multitask. So we increase our diffusion capacity. So what does that mean? Well, that means the uh, alveoli here inside of the lungs, those little satchels, which bring in our, um, our oxygen, we diffuse oxygen into those little bulbs and we saturate the blood with oxygen. Uh, a, a bit better. So we're, we're better at bringing in oxygen into the lungs, diffusing that oxygen across um, the satchels in the lungs and oxygenating the blood. So we get better at that. So when we have changes in the arterial side of the equation, that means we get better at providing oxygen to the blood. Right now, this can go both ways. Let's say you have asthma. If you have asthma, this A is going to go down, right? Because if you have asthma, you have this thick mucus that is going to be interfering with the diffusion of oxygen across the, the, the membranes and into the blood. Okay, so A is focusing on pulmonary function. And again, we decrease the rate of fatigue right here. Check. We increase ven ventilatory efficiency. Check. We increase diffusion capacity of oxygen into the the uh, the blood. So what does that look like? Well, let's let's kill a dead horse here. So if we have our blood, right, and here's the lungs. Well, let's say we are exercising. Uh, this let well let's say before exercise, right? Let's say when we are just being simple couch potatoes. Let's let's get the right color here. Let's say our oxygenation. So we have O2, O2, O2. O2 is diffusing from the lungs into the blood. Let's say we're only oxygenating 60% of the blood with oxygen, okay? Now this isn't necessarily true because if we have anything less than 90% oxygen saturation of red blood cells, it's pretty dangerous. So generally healthy people, have 90 or more percent of their red blood cells uh, saturated with oxygen. But we have to think about what happens with exercise because when we're exercising, heart rate increases, stroke volume increases, which means the blood that is traveling through the lungs is moving at a much faster rate than if you were just sitting down and watching TV. So we get better at saturating the blood during exercise and that takes a bit of time. That takes adaptations, okay? So if we're exercising in somebody that is um, not in shape, they might only saturate 60% of their blood, right? 
Now, uh, if we have somebody that has been exercising for several, let's draw it over here, for several months, well, what's going to happen, here's the blood again, right? Let me just write blood so you guys are all familiar with what's going on here. What's going to happen is because our rate of fatigue has dropped, our ventil uh, uh, sorry, ventilatory efficiency has increased and our diffusion capacity has increased, well, now we have all of this oxygen leaving the lungs and saturating the blood, and now it might be 98% saturation during exercise. So the A, whoop, the A refers to how well we can or cannot saturate the red blood cells during exercise. All right, guys, let's now talk about um, this VO2 difference. Um, so let me change the color here. Let me change, change the color. Here we go. So we talked about the Q, the changes that happen with the heart. We talked about the A, some of the adaptations that happen with the pulmonary system. And now we're going to talk about this VO2 difference. Okay. And what does that mean? What does that, what does that represent? Well, generally, when we talk about the VO2 difference, we're talking about muscle. So remember what I said is we can increase our stroke volume, right? We can have a increase in heart rate performance. We can have an increase in oxygen saturation, but none of that really means anything if the skeletal muscle is not ready to receive uh, the oxygen and the uh, the nutrients coming from that blood. Uh, so, so what that means is that the skeletal muscle has to undergo some changes as well, right? So some of the things that happen in the skeletal muscle, and one of the things I'll mention in the lecture, right? So here's the muscle, right? Um, I'll probably next, actually, once I stop drawing here, I'll probably mention this very quickly. But when we have um, aerobic fitness, we really don't have any changes to muscle mass. M-U-S-C-L-E, mass, right? The muscle doesn't really get bigger or more dense uh, with aerobic training. However, it does get highly metabolic. So one of the things that happens, which is going to help us take in the oxygen that we are now increasing because of this and because of this, we're going to have to develop some, um, some mechanisms in the cell, in the muscle cell to use that oxygen. So one of the first things that happen, and you guys know this, is we have an increase in mitochondria. Right? So we develop more mitochondria as a result. And if we have more mitochondria, well, that means the more oxygen that we're getting from the A, the arterial delivery of it, right? We have more O2 coming in. That means with more mitochondria, we can make more ATP from that oxygen. So that makes perfect sense, right? So let me, let's just kind of switch this over here. Mitochondria, green looks like a good color. So we get more mitochondria the more we exercise, right? In, in, in an aerobic capacity, right? So if we have more mitochondria, well, that results in more oxygen use, right? If we're bringing in more oxygen, we have more mitochondria, we could use more of that oxygen to create ATP. Some of the other things that happen is uh, we get more of these type one fibers, what, what looks like a type one fiber. So uh, as I talked about in class, right? We have type one fibers, we have type two A fibers, and let's do gray, and we have type two X fibers. Well, the more that we exercise in this aerobic capacity, the more we have this shifting, right? So these type two A fibers take on the characteristics of type one fibers, right? So we increase, we increase our type one, and I'll just put aerobic fibers. Makes sense, right? Um, we also, uh, we also increase how long it takes 
to develop lactate, right? So we have, we increase our lactic threshold as well, right? So when we increase our mitochondria, we increase our type 1 fibers, we reduce the onset of lactate. Well, what happens then is the muscle is now prepared to take in more of that oxygen, right? So what does that result in? Well, if we look at this over here, this is what that AVO2 difference means, right? If I have the red side here, this is a capillary, right? If I have the red side, boop, right here, that means this is the oxygenated side, right? We have oxygen coming through. And if I have the blue side on the other side here, this means it's deoxygenated, right? That means the oxygen has been dropped off. So when the muscle is better equipped to take in more oxygen, well then more, oops, let me switch color, more, oh, oh my goodness, more of that, come on now, more of that oxygen can now be dropped off, right? So we have more to deliver. So when we talk about the AVO2 difference, we're talking about this right here, how much is delivered and how much comes back. If you're really out of shape, there's going to be a lot of this oxygen that doesn't get dropped off, right? Just follow my pen. It doesn't get dropped off because the skeletal muscle is not equipped to handle it. And it's going to just kind of keep moving, right? It's going to get, it's going to go through the capillaries and it's going to keep moving. So we might get, let's say 40% of that oxygen comes back to the heart because the skeletal muscle hasn't adapted enough to take on more of that oxygen, right? So let's look at it in this light. Um, let me clean this up. Let's say someone is not exercising, right? And let's say they saturate the blood with 60% oxygen, right? And again, this is during exercise, it's not at rest. And let's say when that oxygen gets to the working skeletal muscle, only 30% of it gets dropped off. So what does that mean? Well, that means 30% of that 60% is going to go back to the heart, which means an untrained skeletal muscle can only take 50% of the total oxygen that is being delivered. And that's not very good, right? So now let's look at somebody that is better trained, right? So if somebody is better trained, we know that because they have adaptations at the heart, they have adaptations at the lungs, now they're going to have 100% saturation during exercise. And remember, the person that wasn't in shape, they only had 60%, right? So that means 40% increase was because of changes to the lungs and changes to stroke volume, right? So those all increased how much oxygen can be saturated on the red blood cells. Now, if this individual is exercising for a long period of time and they have, they have an increase in mitochondria content, they have an increase in type 1 fibers, and they're better at holding off lactate production, well, that means maybe 90% of that oxygen can be dropped off to the muscle because the muscle has a lot of mitochondria, which means only 10% of all that oxygen saturation goes back to the heart. So this is how VO2 works. This equation is purely based on uh, these physiological parameters, right? And when we exercise in an aerobic capacity, we increase how well and how efficient these physiological components uh, operate under exercise. Now, of course, the last thing that happens is we will develop more capillaries, right? So here's here's a capillary, right? And here's the oxygenated side, right? And then over here is the deoxygenated side, right? And that would be the venous, right? So this is the venous, right? And this is the arterial, right? And that's that's what this is referring to. Follow my pen. AVO2 difference. What is the difference between oxygen here on the arterial and here on the venous. Well, when we begin to uh, exercise in, in this um, aerobic capacity, what happens is we will start to grow new capillary beds as well, right? And that will look like this. 
and then we will have the deoxygenated side over here, right? And then we might have something that looks like this, right? Where we start to have another branching of the capillaries, right? And then we have, of course, the deoxygenated side over here, right? And then these will all come back to the venous side here, right? And they'll all kind of return back to the heart, right? So what's going to happen here, is this is this is the capillaries, right? This is the capillaries, this is the capillaries, 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 and then capillaries, just kind of drawing all these, right? So we get more of this um, capillarization, right? We get, we develop more capillaries. And as a result of developing more capillaries, what's so unique about this is the development of more capillaries. Let me clean this up because I'm almost done here and I don't want it to look like a complete hot mess, which it's starting to look like. Um, what happens here, clean, 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 is the more capillaries that we develop, the more this the Q, right, the stroke volume and the heart rate is going to benefit because if we have more capillaries, that means the blood pressure is going to drop at any given exercise intensity, and that means that uh, the heart and the stroke volume can deliver more of the goodies instead of just to one single capillary, right? We have multiple avenues in which oxygen can be delivered and metabolites and waste can be picked up and sent, sent out of the body. Um, it's also going to help with the saturation of oxygen, and it's also going to help with the AVO2 difference. So the development of capillaries kind of checks all these boxes. They all work. Um, they all work a bit more favorably when we have more uh, capillarization. Okay. So that's all I have for you guys in the drawing. I'm going to go back to the slides now, finish it up, and then I will be done. Okay. So back to the very boring slides. Um, like I said in the part where I was drawing, there, there aren't many uh, adaptations to the um, develop or to skeletal muscle itself when it comes to its its size and its structure, right? So we're not going to really build any muscle mass. Um, we don't really have um, too much increase in bone mineral density or alterations in. Uh, bone mineral density. Uh, there have been re research has shown that there have been favorable alterations that occur in the uh, cartilage and uh, among the uh, ACL and MCL as well, um, but not not really too much going on there. It's, it's really more um, metabolic than it is structural. Um, and then lastly here, um, you, you guys can read this. This is very boring. I don't need to read that to you. Um, and I, and I'm going to stop there. So that is your lecture. Please make sure you are ready to answer questions from this lecture, especially about the FIC equation. And, um, I will be in touch very soon. Take care.